Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Now, if you've been following the channel for any period of time, thank you. And if you haven't and you'd like to, there's a like button, a subscribe button and a bell icon that you can click to tell me you like it and also so that you know when I'm next uploading. But if you have been following along, then you've probably noticed that I am quite interested in history. Well, I mean, after all, the clue's kind of in the channel name. But I'm not just interested in the events and people of the past. I'm also really fascinated by the psychology of the study of history. Just why do we focus on individuals or events in the way that we do? Sometimes ignoring or putting to the wayside other events and other people. Now I think for some reason it's natural for us to have a favourite period of history. If you hadn't guessed, I am particularly favouring of the Tudors and early Jacobean period. But I can't tell you why I feel that way. I think that we potentially focus on kings and queens when we study history because that's how we're told to, but also because there's so much information about them. People are constantly scrutinising them during their lives and writing myriad documents about them. We get them from a number of different perspectives, those of their courtiers, but also their diplomats from friendly and also potentially adversarial nations. I think also the people that surround their monarchies can be a focus of our interest, particularly those people who seem to have a stratospheric rise in their political power and also an equally speedy cataclysmic fall. I'm thinking of Sir Thomas More or even Thomas Cromwell as examples of this. And I wonder if they're a focus of our interest, not because they are so much more interesting or influential than those who lived alongside them, but because there's something about their meteoric rise and stratospheric fall that I think echoes the way in which we engage with people, particularly public figures today. We love to build a celebrity up and we also really, really love to tear them down. Now, I'm certainly interested in offering biographies of these more well-known people, but I'd also like to start a series on less well-known people, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And if you can think of anybody that you would like me to do a discovery of or an investigation of from the past, please do leave it in the comments section down below. But today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a gentleman called Sir Thomas Smith. Oxford Dictionary of National Biography entry on Sir Thomas Smith that's written by Ian W. Archer describes Smith as a scholar, diplomat and political theorist. Smith was born on the 23rd of December 1513. He was the second son of John Smith, not to be confused with the alcoholic beverage, and Anne Charnock. He was an exceptionally bright boy, seemingly, and would go on to be a very bright young man and an incredibly educated grown-up. He joined Queen's College, Cambridge in 1526. Of course, there are many ways in for us to explore the biography of historical figures. But when we're looking at Sir Thomas Smith, for me, it's really useful to explore the texts that he leaves behind for his posterity because it's in those texts that we are able to grasp hold of his politics, his policies, and also his personal activities. One such text, the earliest we think he produces, is a discourse of the Commonweal of this realm of England. We think he writes it in around about 1549, and he seems intent that this text remain as a manuscript and that its readership be controlled. In fact, it isn't until after his death when his nephew, the person who inherits his estate, prints it. And his nephew prints this text in 1581, four years after Smith's death. The Discourse of the Commonweal is interesting in many ways. It's set up as a fictional conversation between four English people. And thus it echoes the classical text that, as we will see, Smith is so clearly influenced by. 
In the discourse, Smith lays out an economic and governmental policy that he thinks could potentially assist England to become better and stronger. Among many suggestions, Smith argues that the Commonwealth of England is a ship, that every inhabitant within it is essentially focused on keeping afloat, that the economic and governmental policies of England affect everybody and therefore everybody should be intent on ensuring their success. Smith also promotes the idea of the need of there being a quote, perfect council of learned men. Now, what he seems to be saying here is that it's no longer sufficient for the nobility to assume a blood and birthright place on the Council of England, that actually those people from the universities, regardless of their birth or status, should be accepted into positions where they can advise and help the development of England. Of course, this had happened in the past. We look at the reign of Henry VIII and certain, in quotes, low-born people rising through the ranks to become chief advisers and ministers to the king, and also falling spectacularly, as I mentioned previously. What Smith seems to be saying is that these people shouldn't be the exceptions, they should be the rule. So he's not only calling on the monarch and their counsellors to take advice, he is also saying to his fellow university scholars that it is their responsibility to assist the development of their nation, that it is up to them morally to leave the ivory tower and essentially grub around in the politics and strife of the real world. Smith's discourse also focuses on the economic and trading policy of his nation. He warns about the potential for stranger merchants to, quote, treat the Englishmen as men do little children, give them an apple for the best jewel they have about them. Such is the fineness of strangers' wits and the grossness of ours. In this, I think, Smith is recognising the position that England holds. England is a peripheral volcanic anomaly in the North Atlantic, and at this point, long before there is an empire on which the sun never sets, England simply cannot compete with the trading pragmatism of a Venice or even a France. But Smith isn't saying that we should shut out foreign goods. He isn't arguing that we close the ports and build a wall. He is saying that what we need to do is occupy a protectionist position, that we need to trade with the rest of the world and certainly with the rest of Europe because they have goods that can't be produced in England or that it would be extraordinarily expensive to produce in England. He recognises the skills and goods of other nations as being necessary but also potentially biblically required. He makes the argument that because all of these different places make these different things, it must be part of God's plan that people communicate and trade with one another, because otherwise everywhere would have the same things that everyone needs. What Smith is keen to assert is that we make sure that the goods that come in are matched and balanced with what leaves, that we buy in goods for the appropriate amount of gold and silver, that we ensure that the wares are fine and not fraudulent, that we ensure that they are quality and not trash. He also talks about if we're exporting like-for-like -like goods, that we ensure that the necessary objects that we need, he talks about lead, vittel and ordnance, these are things that arguably supply a well-constructed and fed army, should be in balance with any goods that we allow to come in and be exchanged for them. For Smith, though, what is holding back any progress is the state of the English coinage. In previous centuries, English coin had been, to use an odd term, the gold standard across Europe. Everybody trusted and respected it. However, in the debasement of Henry VIII, and the failure to recoin in Edward's reign, Smith finds himself in 1549, at the time of him writing the discourse, with an England whose coin is so disreputable that nobody in Europe feels safe trading in it. Indeed, in 1547, Smith had joined Protector Somerset, the person who is heading up Edward's minority council. He had joined his household, and he was pushing for the recoinage of England's currency. 
for some reason, Protector Somerset didn't see the necessity in this, and Smith and Somerset fell out spectacularly. And it may be that this is why Smith finds time to write the Discourse of the Commonweal. He has risen in favour and within two years fallen from it. But he does not back down. He sticks to the necessity of the re-coinage, despite the fact that this is the thing that has made Somerset turn so profoundly against him. So what we see here is a man who is laying out his political discourse and ideology, not because it will curry favour with those in power. In fact, what he is doing is actively removing him from that favour. Smith is, for me, a political and economic ideologue. He knows how the nation needs to function and improve itself, and no amount of political disfavour is going to sway him from talking about those needs and what should happen. While it seems clear that Smith was allied with the Protestant cause, it's not something that he advocates for as vehemently as he advocates for the process of recoinage or the need for an economic protectionism or the necessity of having a coterie of educated university men to advise the monarch and their council. Certainly, during the reign of Mary I, Smith lies low. Now, does this mean that he's only an ideologue when political sway is on the table, but is quite happy to keep quiet when his life is at risk, I'm not sure. But if you think you can read into this, please do let me know in the comment section down below. But during the reign of Elizabeth I, Smith is politically rehabilitated and Elizabeth's government does begin the process of recoinage that Smith advocated for. In April 1561, Smith takes up another political torch. He circulates a dialogue on the Queen's marriage where he argues for the justification and necessity of a domestic match for the Queen. It would seem that he would be in favour of her marrying Robert Dudley. Now, this, of course, as we know, would fly in the face of that which was desired by her chief minister at the time, William Cecil. I wonder, is Smith actively seeking to fall out with the monarch's closest counsellor? He took a stance that Somerset had particularly disagreed with during Edward's reign, and now he seems to be taking up a stance that Cecil would find repugnant. I wonder what is motivating this in Sir Thomas Smith. Does he actually believe that only a domestic match will work for Elizabeth, or is he just, for some reason, poking the hornet's nest? What do you think? Let me know in the comments section down below. In April 1565, Smith undertakes another text called De Republica Angolorum, in which he lays out the social and governmental system of his nation of England. He is essentially codifying and presenting a studyable text of how England's laws, economics, social and political policy has been set out and how it functions. Smith was a patron of rising scholarly stars like Gabriel Harvey, and he was an active patron of this particular man. He would bring Harvey together with scholars, diplomats and soldiers at his home of Hill Hall to form essentially that very perfect council that he had advocated for. Now, as with all biographies, I think, there are elements of both light and shade. I would argue that Smith was incredibly useful to his nation in his government suggestions and in his economic policies. He had some wonderful ideas that undoubtedly furthered England and strengthened it and made it a better place to live. However, in the shade of his activities sits his colonial agenda. From his home in Hill Hall, Smith and his so-called perfect council would sit around talking about classical empire building. They would look at classical texts for the ways in which colonies could be founded and empires could be built. From these texts, they also found the ethical framework to support the activities they had in mind. In 1571, Smith was granted lands near County Down in Ireland, an area called the Ards and he was intending to plant a colony, an English colony, on this site. Smith argued that 
these colonies would form an active and useful place for the second sons of the nobility and gentry of England to find employment. These second sons would formerly have found a role in the church, the Catholic church, as monks or priests. But now England was Protestant and there was no Holy See of Rome to provide employment. And Smith was concerned that these second sons might be underemployed or unemployed. And in this lack of effective employment, these second sons might turn to mischief or even criminality. Therefore, it seems that Smith is presenting Ireland as almost a prison colony for the pre-criminal, something that we see later played out and brought into fruition with Australia. He also says that in planting these colonies, not only do the second sons find employment, but also the wild Irish are civilised. And I think in this notion of a civilising goodness, Smith's policy for Ireland has incredibly long tentacles and can be seen being played out in the way in which English colonial forces subjugated and persecuted, for lack of a better word, the indigenous populations of lands the world over. Smith's colonial agenda in Ireland ultimately resulted in a profound personal tragedy. His only son, Thomas Smith, who was illegitimate but still bore his name, was killed in 1573 in Ireland by some Irishmen that he was seemingly sent to, in quotes, civilise. The grief was undeniably profound and Smith lost the heir to his estates. This is why his nephew ultimately takes up that role. And in 1575, Smith resigns his claims to the Ards to Walter Devereux, then first Earl of Essex. What do you think of Sir Thomas Smith? Had you heard of him before this video? If you had, what did you think of him? And if you hadn't, what do you think of him now? I'd love to know if you can think of any other historical figures that you think haven't got the coverage in history that they deserve. Let me know who they are and what you think of this video in the comments section down below. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, let me know by clicking the like button. Please also subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I will look forward to seeing you all in my next video and I hope you're going to have a great day whatever you're doing. Do take care. Bye-bye for now.